Blake, have you ever heard the saying, where the Nord is, the Lord is? Are you referencing the Nordic god Thor? Because this is a Christian podcast, man. We cannot be referencing false gods from other religions. Welcome to the Church Gear Podcast, where we pull the tech director out of the booth and onto the stage to share the most outlandish stories and hidden wisdom from the tech trenches. And now, here are your hosts. I'm your host, Blake Hodges, the only man at the company that owns a pair of women's sweatpants. And I'm here with my co-host, Church Gear's Sultan of Sarcasm, Toby Walters. Uh, we're going to need to address these women's sweatpants. Are you saying that you, I know you're married, so is there like a pair of women's sweatpants in this house? Or are you saying like you personally own and wear a pair of women's sweatpants? All I will say is that when I went to the on-sale rack at a store and the sweatpants were very soft and cheap, I went, eh, doesn't matter. It's at the house. Was the store loft by Ann Taylor? It was not. It was one of those, you know, tourist traps in downtown Franklin. Uh, my wife loves it. And I'm, you know, in this store for 40 minutes. It's like I'm one of the Target guys. That and do the sweatpants have Juicy written, written across the butt? They don't have Juicy, but they do have Lucky written across the butt. Ain't nobody lucky on that butt. <laughs> that butt ain't lucky. All right. Let's get back to the uh, topic at hand. So where the Nord is, the Lord is. So we're going to be talking about keyboards a bit today. Um, so it seems historically that all my good stories of selling gear to celebrities center around keyboards. So let's tell a couple stories, Blake. All right. Uh, I would like to key you up for this story. Why? Thank you. So, uh, three or four years ago, got a message one morning saying, Hey, we need this Yamaha S90. And I didn't really realize that the Yamaha S90 has this very specific patch in it that artists have just like kind of used for the last 20 years and it's the only one that has it and it's just that one patch and so they needed that patch and so they said we have a uh, rehearsal session today in franklin at a studio we need this yamaha s90 can we buy it today and pick it up and i said sure and actually i'll deliver it so this was a uh, very well-known studio in franklin a lot of you know hit records have been recorded there so they say, great, the band is going to be there starting at 10 a.m. for rehearsals. And I said, awesome, I'll just bring it over around 10 a.m. So I show up and go in through the back door into the main studio, and there's a five-piece band getting set up. So I meet the band and hand off the keyboard, and any guesses whose band it was, Blake? Oh, I'm going to guess it's uh, Keith Richards. Keith Richards. No, it was not the Rolling Stones, Blake. Good try. It was Kelly Clarkson's band. Oh, nice. So Kelly was not there, unfortunately. Apparently her band just rehearses the songs and then she shows up and so she's the star. Or the band does all the work. Is that what I'm hearing? Because she's well, not even there. Is That's kind of how it works at Church Gear as well. Oh, so, well, yeah. That's very I'm true. I'm the star and you're part of my band, but you are not Keith Richards. But I am doing all the work, so I'll, I like how this is playing out You're for more me. like Animal from the Muppets. Yeah, I could take that too. Okay, so that was one. Uh, another was uh, somebody contacted me about a Roland. I forget the exact model, but it was like a Hammond uh, copy, and it did the, the Hammond B3 thing. And they said, hey, we're doing a show in South Africa – and the artist requested this specific keyboard, but we don't have it. It was actually a backline company in South Africa. Did you hand deliver that one too in South Africa? Obviously. I mean, what better service than to fly across the world and deliver this thing? Totally. Actually rode on an Elon Musk rocket because, you know, he has a bullet rocket from here to South Africa. I thought you were going to say you rode on his back Yoda style, but even well, better, a rocket. That too. So um, I asked, oh, cool. What's, what's the show? And they said, it's John Legend. Oh, oh my. Okay. That's awesome. Yes. yes. I know him. So sent a keyboard to South Africa. So John Legend, and I don't know if John was playing it or his keys player, probably, even though John plays keys, but that's amazing. I can't believe I have this of all the stories I've heard and I haven't heard this one. That's cool. John Legend uh, is freaking awesome. My goal every day is to just blow your mind with how cool uh, I am, Blake. Well, I don't want to admit that. No. I know. So final story is several years ago, I sold another Roland keyboard, but it was it's like a late 70s, kind of like a string keyboard. It was probably analog. It was a very, I mean, it wasn't like the coolest piece ever, but it was kind of unique in that it was a vintage piece of gear and it did this strings thing. 
And it still had a dusting of drugs from the 70s. Well, it came from my wife's uncle, so I hope not. Well, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> we'll have to ask him later. Sorry, Ron, if you're listening to this. Oh, don't uncle give Ron. the name. Now he's going to get arrested by the feds. I know. Haven't you watched Maisel season two? So sold the keyboard and I looked at the order when it came through and the guy lived in Sweden, I think Sweden, and I'm, I apologize if I'm getting this wrong, but the guy's name was Hans Nordelis. Mm, what a happy accident. I'm sure that's not the real Nord guy. So I did a little digging and that is the Nord guy. No way. Hans Nordelis created Nord keyboards and then he bought this vintage Roland from me, as I would assume, as part of his collection. I was just about to say, what, what is his like motivation to buy back something like that? And probably what he's either he has an incredible personal collection or he's sampling different things to try and use for different Nord sounds. Wow, that is pretty dope. So the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Nord himself has a church gear keyboard in his possession. So from our stock to church stages all around the world where the Nord is, the Lord is. And I just, you know, I want to go on record that church gear had just a little bit to do with that. So then where is it by extension where church gear is, the Lord is as well? Cause that's well, where that, the, the Nord that is. That goes without saying. Also he bought, he didn't buy a Nord piano from us. He bought a church gear piano. It passes through there the magical go. filter. There you go. I love that. Well, we are here with someone who has also got a magical filter when he's playing on his keys it's one of the most storied keyboard players in the world, Blair Masters. Blair, welcome to the show. How's it going? Happy to be here. So do you believe, Toby, that he sold a keyboard to Mr. Nord himself? Or is he trying to fool with us here? Is this one of those uh, five truths and a lie thing? And that's No, lie. you give us the five truths and a lie, so we're not trying to true. pull one. Uh, okay. I'm just not sure my trust factor of you yet. I'm still I know. You know, <laughs> working on it. That's what I I've believe been... you. Why, thank you. I choose to believe. Okay. And you've played many Nord keyboards. Do you do you feel like there is a you know a vintage Roland string sample somewhere in that in one of those boards? Well, do you want my opinion on Nord keyboards? I would Not love it. Go down this Our, road. Well, isn't that later in the segment? Oh, uh, okay. We'll, we'll okay. hold your opinion Sorry. for a little later. I guess we should introduce you. Okay. So. All right, so I'm going to read <laughs> his uh, his truths, and one of them is a lie. Um, oh, gosh. I don't know that we can trust you after this, um, but here we go. <laughs> they could all be lies, perhaps. Ooh. No so one that's has. That's what I was going for. No one has done that yet. I would love that, actually. All right. Had a job playing ragtime piano in a pizza parlor. Number two, once got complimented by Jeff Beck for a fake guitar part I played trying to imitate him. Number three, created a Halloween soundtrack for a roller coaster ride. Number four, worked as a department store Santa Claus. Number five, rebuilt the engine in my 1971 El Camino. And number six, performed in front of two presidents. Dang, this is quite a list. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always suspicious of numbers. I'm going to bet that's like one president or three presidents, and he ad adjusted it down to two. I feel like he... He usually, like every time I see him at church, he'll just be like, Toby, come here. Let me tell you all the cool things I've done recently. And I feel like yeah, one of those it. times was about playing for presidents. I do remember something like I think he was playing for an inauguration. Well, those are my favorite kind of friends that will tell you all the fun stuff. Because, yeah, I'm like, give me something good. <laughs> and I want this <laughs> Jeff Beck thing to be true because and you know, keyboard players can imitate a guitar. It's. It's usually not awesome, but if he can, if he can impress Jeff Beck, that's I want to talk about that. I mean, I guess it's the uh, he rebuilt his engine as, in his El Camino. I don't think he has those skills. I'm gonna say it was the. Uh, I'm gonna go with the first one. Had a job playing ragtime piano in a pizza parlor. Maybe it was like a not a pizza parlor, but he did play the piano just in a different location. All right, our lies are locked in, Blair. They're locked in. You're committing. Yep, I'm committed. You don't want to. Second chance at guessing. <laughs> uh, the lie is that I did not rebuild the engine in my El Camino. Yes, Suck but it, I do Blake. have a 1970. I do have a 1971 El Camino, and it's awesome. Blair, I had so much faith it, in you. I was like, I can't. I know. I can't I'm doubt sorry. him. 
Uh, what if you sold that El Camino to Hans Nordelis? <laughs> then he'd have something from the 70s from both of us. There you go. Okay. Yeah. If he wants to buy it, money talks. And then what if he created a signature Blair Masters El Camino edition of the Nord keyboard? Although you're holding your opinion of Nord keyboards till later in the episode. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Well, Forget. that would be amazing. Forget later in the episode. I want it now. Like, what is so? What is your opinion on the Nord keyboard? I think they're too expensive, and I think they're trendy. But they're uh, red, and they're red. They are red. They're built like tanks. They feel good. I'm just more of a laptop guy. Um, I just and they're heavy. I don't know. They're just. I don't know. I don't get the fascination with how expensive they are so every worship I hate, leader i don't hate them every worship leader and tech director around the world is trying to pull the knife out of their back right now because they all I know that's why i didn't want to bring it i didn't want I to know. talk about it but you i'm heard i'm here, one folks. of a few people that think that way it's just the trendy thing i don't know so then like so they definitely sound trendy and i i get like certain trends like i don't know if you're a bourbon guy but i'm not a huge blanton's fan it's it's very trendy but it's overpriced but it's still good it's just overhyped would you say nord's in that same category like is it still a good piano it's just overhyped or are you oh, yeah. also like it's a bad piano no no it's not bad at all no it's and i don't know enough about them to know uh you know the depth of of everything i just know when people go off about the Piano sounds so amazing there. It's like, yeah, they're good. Mm. But, you know, it's just trendy to me, but I don't know. Okay, so speaking of church keyboards, uh, Blake, a few months back, I was at church and Blair was joining us. He plays keys at our church every once in a while when he's not doing other impressive things. So <laughs> I, uh, after the service, I went up and started chatting with him. And looked out at, I, I think we usually have about seven or 800 people in our a typical service. And I asked him, okay, Blair, how many people were you playing to on, I th it was two nights before, I think it was a Friday night. And what was your answer, Blair? I don't remember. 80,000? Oh my gosh. I think you said 60 at the time, but. Oh, okay, 60. It, it probably depends depend on, on the show. Was. Toby, concert yeah. sizes are just like bass fish. Every time you tell the story, <laughs> it gets bigger and bigger. That's right. So who were you playing right. with, Blair? Uh, Garth Brooks. That's, uh, we're, that's, we're doing that's quite stadiums. a name. Huh. Yeah. So you're playing yeah, to, trippy. you know, 60 to 80,000 people in stadiums with Garth. Yeah. And how in the world did, did that happen? Are you really that cool? <laughs> Cool has never been a word that's associated with me, but um, no, he just called me up and asked if I wanted to do it. Is the simple answer to the question? Uh, Wait, a minute. how did he just? He found you. He called you. Well, back in the this might be before your time, but twenty two years ago now, he did an album that was a the Chris Gaines, uh, the life of Chris Gaines. It was a alter ego kind of pop rock album that was for a movie. You guys familiar with that at all? Oh, yeah. I listen to it every night no. before I go to sleep. Sorry. <laughs> nice. not. Keep going, though. So anyway, it was a um, Gordon Kennedy, who you might know. Uh, he was in the group Whiteheart, guitar player. And he's also out with Garth. He, he wrote most of the songs on the album, and they needed some overdubs done. So Gordon got me involved, and that's where I met Garth. And then I played in his band for that. We did like... Um, we did like the Tonight Show and Conan and Saturday Night Live. That was awesome. Got to play on there. So that was back then, but that ended up being a huge in his in Garth's eyes a huge failure. Which it sold two million records. So I <laughs> wish my failures were that successful. Um, Lame two million. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, since then he Garth has had me play on all his records since then. Uh, come in and do organ overdubs and stuff. And so when he started to do the stadium tour, he just called and asked if I wanted to do it. Wow. So then like, how long have you been playing? You, I'm assuming you play with him pretty regularly. Then how long has that been going? Well, it's this, the tour started in, I can't even keep it straight now, 2019. And then, and but when, you know, with COVID and everything, it's gotten derailed a couple different times. Like it was supposed to be basically 30 dates over three years. 
So we did, I think, 10 the first year. We did like three or four the next year and three or four the next year. And then we're finishing them up this year. We're doing like 17 this year. Oh, nice. Uh, it's going to end up in Ireland for... He sold five shows uh, in Dublin at Croke Park, which is their soccer stadium. Sold five shows. He sold... Uh, it's like 400,000 tickets in two hours or something like that. Whoa. Now, it's uh, crazy. Blair, when you were telling me about how this tour came about and him asking you, it it seemed like you weren't necessarily thrilled to jump on this tour. And I've never been a road guy. <laughs> and so, so I was concerned. What did you ask <laughs> Garth that you told me? I said, is there a lot of band drama? So you're not into because drama. No, no. And I don't like traveling. I just like being home and working at home and being in a controlled environment with music and where I can hear well. And I'm not one of those people, which is really funny because to be on this tour, which is like the biggest tour in the world, I don't get a huge thrill like a lot of people out of being in front of people performing. That's not what floats my boat. So I just laugh the whole time because it's just funny that I'm up there in front of these people. It's hilarious. But so, um, yeah, Garth says, yeah. do you want to play to 400,000 people? And you're like, eh, I don't know. Is there any drama? <laughs> exactly. That's pretty much how it was. I just don't. But my friend Gordon's doing it. And so it's been amazing. Like everybody, I've never been around such a fabulous group of people on a tour. Like there's no drama and it's awesome. Is it intimidating it's not even, to be like playing in front of that many people? No, because no. I mean... Because you don't it's, care. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guessing that, or did somebody told you that? <laughs> no, I'm guessing. That's my that's my motto in life is I don't care. But um, no, I care. I just don't. It's they're just people, and they are not watching me. Like I can walk back after a concert, and people won't even know. After being up there on the stage in front of them, they won't even. I'll be on the elevator with somebody in the hotel afterwards and they'll have a Garth t-shirt on. I'm like, Hey, did you go to the concert? Yeah, it was great. Did you go? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so so it's, I mean, I realized real quick, it's not about me at all, you know? So when you're up on stage, are you more like, this is amazing and this is super fun? Or are you more like, all right, how much longer until I can put my sweatpants on and watch TV in the hotel room? <laughs> my women's sweatpants. Uh, <laughs> With juicy across the butt. Lucky. Exactly. Lucky. Lucky. Sorry. Um, no, it's fun. I'm having a blast. Like, I can't wait till we do the next thing. It's It really is fun. Um, it just, But it's the whole experience of being on, out on the weekend. And it's not the thing about this tour. It's not really touring where you're getting on a bus and going to the next town. And Like, we fly in. We stay in a town for three or four days. And then we fly home. And then... In the beginning, it was like six weeks later, we go do that again. So it's not even really touring. Like, I wouldn't even tell people I was out of town. So, yeah, that does sound nice. I've got fun. a lot of friends who tour like the heavy tours where it's just like, yeah. you know, you're gone for months and months. Yeah. So that setup sounds great. Um, I, I, yeah, that never interested me. And it's, it sounds like you're totally fine playing the background essentially uh, on these tours. And speaking of backgrounds, give us a little bit more about, about yours. Like, how did you get your start? Uh, give us a little play-by-play -play of your career, because I mean, when you start with the the mountaintop of eighty thousand people, Garth Brooks key player, that's like <laughs> that's that's what people dream about when they're playing the keys. Um, oh, I know. How'd you get your start? I well, and I can't believe that at this point in my career, I'm getting to do something like that. You know, most most people like that would hire twenty year old dudes and pay them nothing, and you know, get better looking people. I think I'm the youngest person in the band. And obviously so, the most handsome. Yeah, I was going to say, well, you're the face. Yeah, that's a given. Uh, well, I grew up in Oregon. And how far back do you want me to go in my story? I mean, hit It'll us with your about, first... It, my we, first session, I was in high school. The substitute band teacher at my, uh, at my high school hired me to come play on something. And we became friends. And then from that, I played on this Christian record of these, this duo when I was... I think I was 18... And then they asked me to join their band. So I went to college for two years. And then I quit to play in a band, which was made my parents really happy. Um, I did that for three years. 
and I figured out this is not going to go anywhere. I need to do something else. So I, that's when I moved to Nashville. That was in 88. Um, and I went to Belmont. That was my excuse for moving to Nashville. Um, I didn't quite finish there. I have like 10 hours left to get my degree, which is embarrassing. Um, but I started failing. I failed piano lessons because I was <laughs> working and I wouldn't go to my lessons. It, it just was, you know, I it was only there just to keep me uh, there, to keep me in Nashville or whatever, more than try to learn something. But anyway, um, I just started working, to get doing sessions. Oh, you know, one thing I did when I was in that band in Oregon, this is where it all really started, uh, to make money, because I wasn't getting paid anything in the band, I worked for a sound design company that did samples for keyboards, going back to what you were talking about with the Nord thing. Uh, this was back when sampling had first started, and it was, it was um, not easily accessible to normal people, because the the keyboard that I was working on doing samples for was like a twelve thousand dollar keyboard. So not. So you talking like Insonic and Kurzweil stuff, like the early. This was before. It was the Emulator Two. The Emulator Three was the one I was working on. Okay. Um, and I remember the when the Mirage came out. That was the first like the Insonic Mirage, the first inexpensive sort of, which it still was a couple thousand dollars. But um, so I was doing work for that company. I moved here. I stayed doing work for that company. That they were in Portland, Oregon, and um, I got a call from. You guys knew Charlie Peacock is right. I do. And Bur- Blake does not. Bandit. I guarantee. Yeah, you. he runs that streaming service, Peacock. It's a great service. <laughs> I know those names, but Blake knows nothing. Well, that's. I'm wondering who all is going to know these. Names. You know Brown Bannister. You know that. Yes. Name? Yep. Christian music producer. Right. So. Charlie was working on his Secret of Time record. This would have been in 89. And he um, called the company I was working for wanting to buy some sounds, just like a regular old customer. Like Mr. Nord calling to buy the keyboard. Obviously. And uh, so the guy at the company said, hey, we got a guy in Nashville. He can just come show you everything we have. So I basically showed up out at the Castle Recording Studio as a salesman for these sounds. Um, I set up. And Brown came out to my car and helped me load my stuff in. And so it was just me and Charlie and Brown. And I didn't know who Charlie Peacock was. Now, I knew who Brown Bannister was. Hold on a second. So the Castle Recording Studio in Franklin? Yeah. So, Blake, I don't think you know this. There's a there's a recording studio in Franklin. It's kind of like back in the hills a bit. And it, it looks legit like a castle. And what it is, is it used to belong to Al Capone. No, in it, Franklin? Yes. That was his True. like Nashville hideout. And it was part of his whiskey trail between like Florida and Chicago. Wait a minute. Why did he have a whiskey trail? Was Al Capone running whiskey? Well, he was maybe it wasn't whiskey, but this was during Prohibition uh, where alcohol sales were illegal. And he was like the number one gangster in the country running illegal alcohol. That makes total sense. Wow. OK, that's and dope. There's, there's a lot of stories about the castle. Uh that there's a secret tunnel if you go down to the basement. I would assume there's leads bodies down. buried as well somewhere. <laughs> That's <laughs> well, what they probably. used to pave the secret tunnel. Well, there's a secret tunnel that supposedly leads down to the Harpeth River so he could get out if mm. he had to, is it, the story. I've yeah, never it's, seen It's said not tunnel. far from there, you know, maybe quarter mile. No, it's right. No, it's, yeah, it's not. Interesting. So I don't know if that's, I'd be, it'd be fascinating to see if that's true. But so, uh, what was I saying? Oh, so I set up the keyboard at the studio there and I start going through sounds and I'm there like 15 minutes. Charlie goes, Hey, hang on a second. And he runs out of the room, grabs a reel of tape and throws it on. And I start doing overdubs and I ended up spending the next two weeks out there. I would go to Belmont during the day and I'd go out there in the afternoon and just hang out and wait around to do overdubs. And I spent a couple weeks doing that. And so then after talk that about right place at the right time, Oh, totally. Because I'm not a. Um, you failed you your piano lessons, this. so you wouldn't you wouldn't know this from my dynamic personality. But I'm not a big uh, self promoter guy, you know. Yet you made it onto tend- this podcast. I know that's pretty See, impressive. You guys were desperate, is what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell, or don't you, give or up. You're the tr- goods. Or you're trying to torpedo your whole. Deal. That's right. Well, uh, we tried for Garth Brooks, but he's like, well, I got this keyboard player. He doesn't really like to yeah, do things. Yeah, exactly. And, Close enough. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that, so after that, I started working on, 
everything that Charlie produced and everything that Brown produced. I worked on the Amy Grant Heart and Motion record. I've spent hours working on that because Charlie wrote song, some songs on there and Brown produced it. Um, and they were producing anyway. everything back then. So you found yeah. the right guys. And then totally. Is- is that, kind of into the, is that kind of the story of your career then from there? Is like you were at the right place at the right time. You'd been practicing. Yeah. You had the skills. And so you, your skills met the moment well, of good luck. And then suddenly right. you were just, you've been playing for people in Nashville ever since. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. And it's all, you know, it's a relationship town. So, and I've mentored a couple of younger guys that are doing what I'm doing or whatever. I wouldn't want to be moving to town right now trying to be a studio guy, but. Because it's just all different than it used to be. But, um, yeah, the one thing I tell them, I probably can't say it in the language that I uh, say it to them. But oh, we'll bleep it's like, it out. You will? Sure. Okay. Well, it's like, you're obviously talented. and It's like, I mean, if you're honest, most contemporary music or pop music is not like taxing on your ability to play, yeah. right? If you're honest about it. There's a different skill set in the studio with just being able to play in the studio is a different animal than playing live or whatever. But as far as, you know, technique and stuff, a million people are good enough to do whatever. The ones that do well are the ones that people like. So don't be a dick mm. is my, that's my advice. There you go. <laughs> to people. Don't be a Richard. You heard it here. No, I don't mean, be a that's, Richard. that's very consistent across career paths. Like I, I oh, know yeah. like my wife's a professor I hear about like you want to hire someone you you want to work with or like when you're hiring candidates yeah. who like every, a lot of people are qualified. Who do you want to like? Actually, I think the person who gave her that advice was your wife, Toby, because um, Toby's wife is also a professor. And she was like because Allison was trying to interview at places and she she said, hey, you know, be likable. And that's how we hire church. Gear. We're like, eh, I don't want to see your resume. Do we like hanging out with you? It's it, it makes right. total sense. So and that was that was one of the things on the tour. Uh, I don't know if you guys. I know you're huge Garth Brooks fans, but the documentary that was on A and E, that's what they talk about. The drummer is the back in the day. He's the still the original drummer, still with us. But he um, he put the band together. I think is what I heard. But it was based on can we live in a van together? Unfortunately, thing. I did not ask that question when I hired Blake, and here I am on a podcast with him. It's an absolute nightmare. Yeah, he should have checked likability a lot more. He's got <laughs> juicy on his butt. It just, it never stops. Yeah. The, the surprises, <laughs> they, they keep on coming. So Blair, nice. you've, you've done a lot of studio stuff. You've done, I'm sure, a number of live things, but you also play in church. So I don't know if there's some magic formula of how those things differ or if it's a lot of the same, but, you know, we have a lot of church people listening. So give any, you know, wisdom as to how it's different you know, being in the studio environment, being on tour with Garth, and then translating those skills into the church, and how can people just be better keys players in a you know modern worship environment? Well, that's a good question. Don't overplay. <laughs> it's kind of the same with any playing in a band or whatever. Just don't you know know your spot and stay in your lane. I guess if that makes sense. When it, I've spoken a couple like worship conferences or whatever. And the first thing I say to the key players are, you don't need your left hand, mm. you know, which is sort of true if you're playing in a band. Cause if you play every keyboard, like you do, like you would a piano, cause people growing up playing piano, they're the only instrument in the room. They're basically the whole orchestra or whatever, you know? Yeah. And that's, it's the different thing than playing in a band. So, um, so that, that those kind of things are, the same whether you're playing in a worship band or you're playing on stage or you're doing studio work, it's all, um, you really need to listen to the other people, I guess, is one thing that people don't uh, do enough of is pay attention to what's going on around them. I mean, that's a general problem with humanity, but that's a different discussion. <laughs> so don't um, try and recreate that Jeff Beck solo. On you want to hear that story, noise. don't you? Oh, now I do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I saw that you guys interviewed Ryan Sutton. Yeah. Right. Ryan's done stuff so, with Jeff. Yeah. So, well, I was with him. Okay. We were working on we're the Frankie Valley and Four Seasons Christmas record. And and I basically programmed the whole record. And there's even some acoustic guitar stuff that I did that's fake, right? Well, there's one kind of blues tune. And, um, and I mapped out, you know, the song and whatever. And 
I was talking to Bob Gaudio, who the producer, and he was like, um, well, who can we get to play? He said, can we get somebody to play guitar on this? I'm like, absolutely. I know tons of people. And he says, what about Jeff Beck? And I'm like, well, Jeff Beck would be awesome. <laughs> Go ahead and get him. And if he couldn't do it, he was going to call, uh, oh, what's his name? The dude from Led Zeppelin. Because those guys are Jimmy Frankie Valley and Jimmy Page. That was He was next on the list. Yeah, why call. not? How about Keith yeah. Richards, Blake? Yeah. I, I'll call, call him, him right now. <laughs> yeah. It was so funny. Um, and so it, it worked to, uh, he got Jeff on board. So I had to map out, the, do an MP3 of the song. And I played some guitar crap where we wanted Jeff to play, just so he could be familiar with it or whatever. And are you doing it and on I, keyboard? Uh, on the keyboard, okay. yeah. And I was just, it was just funny to me. So I did it. So then Jeff comes to town and we go out to Dark Horse, another studio in Franklin. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be there. I didn't have to be there, but I was like, heck yeah, I want to be there. Yeah. Jeff so back. Come Jeff on. walks in, nice to meet you. And we're sitting there talking. He goes, hey, so who did the, uh, you know, makes the motion with his hand about the, the fake guitar thing on that or whatever. I was like, I put my head down like that was me. And he goes, you know, that's what was great about that is that's actually sort of how I would have, you know, sort of sounds like something I would do. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I wish I had that on video. I know. Because it was really funny. Imitation is the purest form of flattery. And he flattered yeah. you back with yeah. that compliment. That's nice. Yeah, It was pretty great. So that was cool getting I, to meet him. I mean, you've had some really great moments throughout your career. You've played in some really big shows and sessions. What's been like your favorite show or session? And you can't use that story because you just gave it to us. Right. Um, and I wasn't even really playing on that. You know, one of my favorite records that I've ever got to play on was Sarah Groves' um, Add to the Beauty, which I don't, you guys know who Sarah Groves is? I, yes. Former uh, sort of. CCM artist. Yeah. And that was, it was probably, I don't even know how long ago that was, 10 or 15 years ago. But I just, it was something, you know, magical about the whole thing. It was just, a, we spent like a week tracking, which nobody does anymore. You know, you're lucky if you, you know, spend two days tracking an album. Um, I will say there were a couple of Mercy Me records. Sorry, I'm just thinking of all these things. Uh, one Mercy Me record, we went up to New York and spent three weeks at a studio up in the Catskill Mountains. That sounds uh, awesome. It was great. And there was a chef there making us meals. And you, it's just great because you get away and you're not distracted by anything. You know, people stopping in the studio or whatever because you're really remote. I don't think my phone really worked. So it was pretty... Awesome. And then a couple of years later, we went to a studio um, in Idaho, just outside of Coeur d'Alene. Um, and we did that same thing. It's a, uh, we did two weeks and you stay there, they cook for you. And those are great memories. And the Mercy Me guys are awesome guys. So it's just all we're doing is screwing around the whole time. Did yeah, that answer your question? I love that, uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think when you've done you know, Garth Brooks touring and played with Jeff Beck. I know I'm stretching that story a little bit, but, you know, for you to say that Sarah Groves was one of your favorite moments of all time. And it's kind of like you never quite expect uh, those moments and, you know, playing on our church audience that sometimes when things go wrong or sometimes you don't expect it, it's just an average Sunday morning, like just something special happens. Now, obviously, the Nord had to be there. Was there a Nord on Sarah Groves record? Because where the Nord is, the Lord is. This was pre-Nord era. Oh, my goodness. Is there even such a you thing? Know, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, my I have a Yamaha C7 grand piano here in my studio. And um, at the time of that record, I was actually moving it down to Brown Bannister's studio because he was going to let me sample it to get back. See how all these things tie together? Um, <laughs> and... The day that it was getting moved to his studio, we were tracking Sarah Groves' record at a studio up on Music Row, and we did one song, and they did not like how the piano sound sounded, and um, they had a C7 there, but they just didn't like it. So they, I called the piano movers who were en route to Brown's studio. I said, hey, bring it over here instead. So they brought it over to this studio and set it up there for the week for the album. So that was cool. Yeah, that's super fun. Nice. It's it but, does seem like a lot of times the the best 
opportunities come from just being around. Like even if you don't know what's going to come of it, maybe nothing will come of it. Be available and then opportunity will find you. Right. That's the thing. Yeah. Be available. The other thing, though, that could find you is a disaster. Things can come at, at random, and it's like, oh, no, I've, I've fallen into the, a trap. Um, so we talk about disaster stories here a lot because it's just fun. It's, uh, we do this, this show for tech directors, creative arts community of the church, and we'll talk to guys who are mixing behind the board a lot. And when you've been in tons of shows, uh, something wild has had to have happened at some point to you, and you've had that, oh, crap moment on stage. Um, now, typically, when people have their old crap moments on on the show, it's behind the board. Uh, this time, it, you're on stage, so you might not even know right. what is happening. But give us a fun uh, live sound. Or in a sound. session. Or in a session. Yeah, either way. Just you're like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Yeah, yeah maybe it's a session where the whole album got deleted at the end of the week or something. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I was on a session when I, back in Oregon one time when I um, somehow the studio owner wrangled me into engineering, which I had no business doing. And we were recording kids vocals as an A track. And I mowed over a bunch of vocals. So that was a, Oh crap. These things it's on anal. It's not like pro tools where you can undo. It's like gone forever. But, uh, that was, that was not a story. I would, uh, that was just one that just popped in my head. Um, there was a, uh, gosh, there's so many, so many oh crap moments. <laughs> One of my favorite ones that happened at church was when we were, I don't, this might have been before you were there, Toby. This was over at the school. Did you ever go to church over there? No, at I did. Franklin High School. So we're, it was Easter Sunday, and um, the big the big musical number was that Nicole C. Mullen song. Uh, what's her big? It's a big Easter song. I don't remember, but whatever. You'd know it. Sure. Big ballad. Yeah. So we did that. So, so for the postlude, we are uh, going to just play an instrumental version of that. Well, we didn't really talk about it. And the chart has a repeat after the first chorus, going back to the verse. And this was when um, the worship leader said, yeah, we'll just start at the chorus. Well, we didn't really talk about once we get through a chorus, are we going back and doing a verse or are we going on to the bridge? And the bridge kind of changes keys. Mm. So half of us went back to the verse and half went to the bridge. Ooh. And it was the it was the greatest failure I've ever been a part of. It was I was dying. It was so funny. I it's was like laughing. a musical train wreck on a bridge. Oh, it was where unbelievable. The bridge collapses. I actually yeah. I have a recording of it and I called it uh worship train wreck is what I called it. This is um, amazing. I'll send it to you because it's pretty funny. Um and it's all and John May, you know John Mays, right? Yes. Do you know John Mays? He was yeah, playing Centricity bass. Centricity Records, right? Yep. Mark Hammond, you know Mark? Yep, sure. Produces Blake doesn't a bunch know of any Disney of these things. Oh, I'm just, I'm just smiling and nodding. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and Mark was playing drums, so it was, it was epic. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I was so proud to. It's like I'm more proud of that than I am ashamed. Like I proudly play it for people because it's it was so epic. Now, if I that just happened, to laugh at that kind of stuff. If that happened in a Garth show, what what would his response be? Would he just sort of laugh it off, or would you all be fired? Uh, oh, we wouldn't be fired. He, he might just stop it and start over. He's so, you know, it's not about being about perfection. You mm -hmm. know, he'll go out there and somebody will request, he'll take requests in the middle of the, in the middle of the set and it just Whoa. does not with his acoustic guitar and he'll go, sure. And he'll start playing and then he'll get to where it's like, oh, I don't really know the chords to this. <laughs> that is but funny. He'll, so he'll just make some up or he'll just go, hey, ah, he'll just stop playing. Or he'll like, I don't know the words. Y'all sing it and get them to sing it. That's it's great. just like, it's, and everybody knows the words. It's yeah. unbelievable. It's a whole unique thing. He should it's listen not, to his no, own records. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, but there was, we, we were playing in Boise, Idaho. It's the only time something horrible happened on the tour. Um, and it was, I think they had those Yamaha, some big Yamaha. What's is it? PM one D is that, is that a current model? Uh, it's not a current model, but a lot of people so still it's love whatever it. The, I'm sure it's whatever the current digital console, there was an opening act. Something happened. We're like halfway through the first song and we're hearing, I started hearing these big booms and I'm like, I was a little nervous because I thought, are these are there gunshots going off or are there, you know, because you don't know what's happening. Yeah, that's very and, true. And 
And then it started sounding different. And I'm like, something's wrong. Well, the whole console died, basically. Ooh. Like the whole thing. So the whole front of house was down. So all that was going on was wedges. Yeah. Which there's not very many wedges because we're on in-ears. So uh, we, he said, we're going to leave the stage here for, and give the guys a couple minutes to sort it out. We walked off stage, and by the time we got back in the hallway, it was time to. They had it sorted out. They just had to reboot the console, but it was sketchy there for a minute because you never know what's going to, you know, how people are going to respond to that kind of a, the, or if the show's going to be over. Because what are you going to do? I think now we carry an extra console. <laughs> I was okay. about to say a lot of times people will have two consoles. They'll have a backup console. I think I think we do. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Is that is that the worst or like craziest thing that's ever happened on a, a Garth show? I'm guessing y'all have, you know, as, so much as far gear as that, and budget you don't typically run into issues as much. Right. That's probably on the on one of those shows. That's the most memorable thing that that went wrong uh that I know of. I'm trying to think. I mean, there's time, you know, he he does this thing where he, he'll when he's done playing a song, he'll toss his guitar to the guitar tech over there. And sometimes it's a game to him. He'll see how far he can launch it. And there was one show where it was like, it had to been 20 yards. This thing was 20 feet in the air and sailing. And usually when that happens, the guy will catch it. But this one time he overshot it. So it's just like, you just kind of watch it and just <laughs> crash and burn. You know, it's just funny. Wow. I've, I've heard of musicians uh, crashing their guitars on stage, but that's a unique method. Normally it's a, uh, you know, sl like a sledgehammer that was just like a frisbee toss right yeah no yeah this yeah exactly so i i think the guitar survived actually so oh nice uh, music but, gear is pretty durable in our experience um yeah so give us a give us a tech takeaway so this might be this will look a little different for you because you're you know keys player but you know the people who are listening are predominantly church techs church worship leaders they, they've got a mission every week make sunday awesome and any little any little bit helps. So like any any tip where you're like, you know what? Even if it was just a tiny tiny thing, where it's like this would always make my Sundays better because you've you've played at church as well. Um, and a lot of these end up being philosophical. It's not like I always use right. my pre saved mix on my such and such key. Oh right thing. right right. So what would be a tech um, takeaway from Blair Masters? Well, I don't know if it's a tech takeaway, but I suppose it could be considered tech, but. Have good charts for the band members because okay. a lot of times people, does that count as something? No, that's great. I haven't heard that one before. It, it's my pet peeve um, because a lot of guys will go, and I'm sorry if I aggravate most of your listeners with this statement. <laughs> a lot of people go to the CCLI website and download the lyrics and they have the chords on there. Well, if I don't know the song, that doesn't mean jack to me. <laughs> Seeing the words and the chords, I don't know the timing of anything. I don't know anything. So, and also don't rely on people to just learn the song and show up and play it because people don't hear things the same way, you know? So if you have a chart, that is the, you know, that's home base. Everybody's looking at the same thing. So your, your potential for screw ups is a lot less. I just assumed the Lord is in the cord, so he'd smooth all that over. But oh my goodness! Wow, that that yeah. failed more miserably than uh... that was brilliant. <laughs> okay, it was a it was a nice rhyme, I will say. So then it happens all the time. So then it sounds like rehearsal is a pretty big deal. Then, like you can't just well, you know say here's the set list for this week and, and assume everyone will do it. You got to really make sure that rehearsal. I'm probably happens. the wrong guy to ask that because I if I had my way, we would not rehearse ever. But Oh. I'm that I'm I'm one of the few people that <laughs> he wants to be home in his sweatpants. Well, now I don't understand That's anything. Right. I thought I thought knowing all of the having the, the charts was so that you would know the songs and rehearse together. Well, that's that's what you should do if you're a responsible person. That's just not me. <laughs> no, the, but the charts, the reality is if you have players that can read the charts and are familiar with the songs and if the charts are true and correct, you should be able to make it through without having a rehearsal. Mm. But I'm not saying don't rehearse. But uh, the chart thing is a big deal. You'll, you'll, your, your rehearsal time will be a lot more efficient if you have good charts. And you won't be stopping going, now what do we do after this? It's right there. Look at it. You know? Does that make sense? 
No, totally. Yeah. You got to have a game plan. Right. So the, just that preparation. There was a there was a time, I'm not going to say any names. Uh, Uh-oh. Well, I showed do. up at a service. No, I showed up at a service one time to play, and and it didn't go well, but it's because the dude had those stupid CCLI charts, which don't mean anything. And um, he was complaining that CCLI got the chords wrong when we after because it didn't go well during the the first service or whatever. I'm like, way to throw CCLI under you? the bus. Yeah, I'm like, dude, you're getting paid. Write the charts. <laughs> well, but that's just me. No, I, okay. So now maybe I think I'm understanding it. Like at a high level, you got to make sure that the things you are providing for your team, they understand. Like you're speaking the same language. You both know like this is what we're doing. This is the plan. We understand what – like we both are speaking the same language here. So I'm, yeah. I'm hearing you. Yeah. Well, Blair, man, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I uh, I love those stories. And uh, it's, it's just so crazy to hear your life's um, – trajectory to just like from one hangout to the next and suddenly you're on a stage with 80,000 people. That's yeah, pretty crazy. It's, it is crazy for sure. Is there anything you'd like to plug? I mean, at this point in your career, you seem like you have ascended past plugs, but I wanted to give you a shot if there's anything you wanted to. <laughs> and besides the women's sweatpants that you're both currently wearing. Yeah. I mean, I know you have a brand of women's sweatpants, but I didn't know That's if that was right. premiering on the show. You know, what's funny is I'm a jeans guy. So if I'm home, I'm wearing jeans. And I'm also wearing my shoes all day long. I'm not a walk around barefoot guy. I'll wear my shoes until I go to bed. Okay. Everybody else in my family walks around barefoot. You know, what do you guys do? Are you shoes guys or bare feet guys? I'm a flip flop guy. Any and every day I can possibly wear flip flops. I Being think I knew that about San Diego. You. My back has been hurting since I was in high school because I'm an old man. And so I do wear shoes typically to bed as well or something, something that wears shoes mind. to bed, like shoes up until bedtime. <laughs> like I don't wear them in bed, but I'm I'm wearing something just to soften the blow on my feet. I think my dad's the same way because there was this time where my sister has a friend come over. She takes her shoes off and he looks at her and he says, no, make yourself at home. Put your shoes on <laughs> because that's they- funny. Because to us, that was comfy, but people typically don't right. want you to wear shoes in their house. I know it. But she was so right. confused. She was like, do you want me to leave? He's like, no, be comfortable. Put your shoes on. So, yeah, I'm a shoes That's guy funny. as well. Uh, I don't know that I have anything to plug. Um, Just not I Nord say, keyboards. Well, <laughs> I'm not prepared to. to yeah, that's it. Um, have you guys interviewed Jim Daniker? We no. haven't. Jim Daniker. Do you know Jim? No. He's Michael W. Smith's... Uh, Band leader guy, keyboard okay. player. He'd he'd be great. He's much more interesting to talk to awesome. than I am. Um, this is the first time anybody's company. plugged like another guest for no, us. No, this is so yeah, I, I love yeah. this. Well, he would be great. He'd be happy to do it too. But he um this might be going off the rails. He had a or has a small company that um designs sounds for you know, a lot of people use main stage. Mm-hmm. You familiar with that? Yes. For their in bands on their laptop. So he designed sounds for that specifically for the church hmm. and his, it was, it's doing well. And we actually released, I was telling you about sampling my piano. Um, I did that like, it's been like 12 years ago, but recently we released it through his thing uh, for main stage, the, the piano. Um, so it's, it's a pretty great piano sound and there, Jim does fast, just does great work. Uh, and he just did a deal with, is it multi tracks? Is that a company? I believe so. For for church, yes, like backing tracks. Yep. Anyway, they're taking over his running that stuff, and I think that my piano is going to be one of their main things that they sell, sound wise and stuff too. Oh, so nice! It's pretty cool. It's called the Blair Masters Signature Grand. Catchy name. Dang. Well, how do we rhyme that with Lord, where the Blair Masters signature piano sound is the Lord is? Or if you, you know, some, yeah. If you want some flair, just use Blair. Ooh. If you want to sound like a master, use Blair Masters. I mean, we, See, we can make this work. There you go. Yeah, I've had people, I've, when I try to figure out what to name my studio or like I'm working on an instrumental thing, sort of, and what to call it or whatever, people come up with the goofiest names using my last name, the Master's Touch. Oh, I'm I'm sure master gets no. used in a lot of funny ways. I, yeah, it's it's really funny. 
now when people say it, when they people give me a compliment or something on my phone on a session, I'm like, it's not Blair demos. Sorry, it's an inside. Oh uh, yeah, no, I, lo- see, I love playing. See. Yeah, I'm glad someone did it because I don't know the knowledge to do it, but I know there are masters, and I was like, someone yep. needs to make this joke. Yep. Well, man, again, we appreciate you coming on, and we'll have to hit up your friend to get him on the pod. We're coming for you, Daniker. Thanks for listening. And hey, congratulations on Surviving Sunday. If you happen to make it through next Sunday as well, join us again for your weekly Tech Breather. Blake, can you even name a single Garth Brooks song? Uh, Going Down the Country Roads, Back to My Old Home? No, how about I've Got Friends in In Low low places. Places? Yes. Now, what should your friends in low places do? They should laugh and enjoy the Church Gear podcast. Because if you want to, you know, have friends in low places, they got to have something to get them up into the high places, the enjoyment of life. So So you're saying the Church Gear podcast will help your friends get high. It will. You know, high where the Lord is and where the Nord is and all of that. So text a friend this episode right now that you think would uh, enjoy getting high on the Church Gear podcast. All right, that's it. (laughs) 